We're on a series called Influence. And today we're going to be talking a little bit more about Moses and his influence within his life. But as a youth pastor, one of the greatest things that we have with our students would be our influence. And over the last week, our youth ministry, they were at Falls Creek in Davis, Oklahoma for a week. And, and Rachel had the privilege with her counselors is having a week-long influence within our students. Uh, got to talk with them, share with them, minister to them. I had the privilege of watching some of our senior girls lead some of our other girls to the Lord. And it was a, it was a wonderful sight to see the influence that Rachel had on the older girls and the older girls having on the younger girls. But it's all about influence. It's all about giving your life to others and sharing with others. And Rachel's going to come up and just give us a brief overview of what took place this week at camp. So Rachel, let's give her a round of applause. Wonderful job. She, uh, she's probably dead tired, probably fall asleep up here. She probably didn't get much sleep, but she said it was well worth every second. It is. Sorry, I, can, I don't know if you guys can hear me very well. I'm going to try to talk well. Um, this was an amazing week. I feel like camp is always an amazing week. I feel like here during the year is amazing with your kids. So first of all, I just really appreciate you letting me take them and have them and just be with them sometimes. So um, we had a smaller group than normal. Um, we had a lot of stuff, there's summer school and different things that went into it. And so I think in the beginning, some people were kind of like, oh, our group's a little bit small. We had about 44 people. Start um, discipling with each other is a really very, very cool thing to get to experience. So the week was all about talking about going and and you know, are we saved? And then what does that look like? And what does our life look like after we're saved? And so we kind of went through the week. We had a lot of kids talking and ministering to each other. And then on the last night, um, we usually do this thing that's called the worship experience, where it's in our own cabin. And usually there's a lot of crying. There's a lot of um, talking and just like this big emotional thing. Well, for the last couple of years, I've been really um, contemplating, like, should we do that? Should we change it? Because I don't want it to become a thing where it's fake. Not intentionally, but you know what I'm saying? Like, where we are looking forward to when God will move on Friday night. So this year, I didn't mean for it to get out, but I decided we weren't doing that. And in the beginning of the week, I heard the kids start saying, we're so excited to do that. We're so excited. And then as somebody let it out that we weren't doing it, they were kind of bummed. And let me be clear, there was no, like, we had no problems this year. There was no, like, bad attitudes. Like, nothing was bad. So this grumbling was just like a small, like, not a big deal. So they're like, we, are, we don't really know if, what, like, what will we do on Friday when God doesn't move? And we talked to the kids, like, he is moving all week long. He's moving when you are not at camp. He is speaking to you. It doesn't have to be when we've planned it that he's going to then speak to us. So um, as the week went on, I started getting a little tired. Um, and so I really wanted to talk to the kids about prayer. And I really love how the Holy Spirit begins to kind of move as we are listening to what he's asking, because my lesson was not anything what I intended it to be when I prepared it to go to camp. And um, on Friday, I went up to this prayer garden, and I spent some time there, and I really just felt the Holy Spirit. Like, it was a very cool moment for me because I was going to talk on prayer, and then this prayer garden just really kind of confirmed for me what I was going to do. So I love how the Holy Spirit totally speaks to me as well during these times. So I'm just going to share a little bit of that with you guys today, if that's okay, from my lesson. And part of this I did not write, I copied, because do you guys know the Lord of the Rings? Has anyone seen the Lord of the Rings? Yeah. Okay. I didn't really know, but so I'm going to read the part about that because um, I'm not a Lord of the Rings person. So basically it talks about when we pray with our whole hearts, we can become dangerous. Um, the word dangerous in the dictionary is defined as being able or likely to cause harm or injury likely to cause problems or to have adverse consequences. Simply put, dangerous is seen in the dictionary as something that will harm us in some way. But we started to talk about when we pair dangerous with prayer, it comes a completely different definition. So in the second book of the Lord of the Rings, the two towers, there are two hobbits that are taken by a tree. Um, and his name is Ent. I'm gonna, don't, I'm gonna try my best with these names. I have no idea. So um, there's a little guy. His name's Gimli, and he's a dwarf. And he's kind of confused um, as he's talking to Gandalf, which is the, like the main white wizard. He's the leader, and he talks to him. And he says he acts like this tree who's stolen them is their friend. He says he asks Gandalf, "I thought that 
Fangorn was dangerous. And Gandalf replies, dangerous, and so am I. I am very dangerous, and more dangerous than anything you will ever meet, unless you are brought alive before the seat of the Dark Lord. And Argorn is dangerous, and Legolas is dangerous, and you are also dangerous. For you are dangerous in yourself and in your own fashion. So when we begin to pray with our, our whole hearts in a very pure way, we can be dangerous as well. Um, when we are having a conversation with the God of the universe, like I just think about how powerful that is. Because sometimes it's easy for us to pray in small ways or like pray while we are falling asleep. And not that those are bad, but when we really focus on this prayer time, um, how dangerous we can become. And we are dangerous against Satan. Right? He, it makes him very angry because we are beginning to follow Christ with our whole lives, with our whole hearts, and we're putting all those things in place that we can really become dangerous. And so that's what I talk to the kids about a lot. Um, you know, we asked you guys to pray for us every year, and this year was really cool because I asked um, a group of the church members to write letters to kids. Some of them knew the kids, some of them didn't, but basically I just wanted you to write a letter of encouragement, say, hey, I'm praying for you, and it was different than us or like normal people that are you talk to every single day. So on Tuesday night, I placed these cards from several of you on all their beds, on their pillows, and so it was really very cool to hear that not only did we say we're praying before we go, but partway through the week they are reminded that people who may not even know them are praying for them. And I had a lot of the kids come up and say, hey, can you introduce me to my person? And so just so you know, I might be bringing kids to you so you can kind of see um, they're just really excited that somebody was praying for them. But I would just encourage you guys too that as we've now come back from camp, we don't want it to just be a thing that was emotional and exciting, but that we need to continue to be in prayer for our youth kids and for, for our own kids, for others' kids, just for our ministries and, and our church as well. So if you would continue, you can take your bracelets off if you want, but just continue to be in prayer for our youth ministry because God is really working in a lot of their lives, and it is really amazing to get to watch. So if you guys would just join me in that um, throughout the year, that'd be awesome. So thank you very much for letting us go and supporting us through our fundraisers and just through all the different ways because it takes all of us to make this thing happen. So thank you very much. It is awesome to see um, students and watch their influence within their life. Uh, Courtney? Courtney? Uh, since you stood up, I, you, you just brought all the attention right to you right there. So um, I wasn't going to say this, but now that I saw you in here, I thought, you know, it'd be an awesome time to use you as an illustration as an influence. Wednesday night at camp, um, they came back from the camp, and Courtney was tired. You could tell it's been a long day, and she was tired. And uh, one little girl that uh, comes to the church here walks up to her and says, hey, can I talk to you? And I saw, I saw the conversation, and Courtney says, yeah, let me put my Bible down, and I'd be glad to to talk to you. So they went up and they went up on the balcony and uh, they sat there for about 35 or 40 minutes and just talking and sharing and then they came down and uh, they went and talked to the parents and then they came and talked to me and Courtney had the privilege of leading one of our girls to the Lord and it was a very sweet time seeing a teenager leading another teenager to the Lord in a very humble time. So congratulations. That's great influence. Now you can leave. Now, you can walk out when I'm getting ready to preach. That's great influence there. <laughs> Just get up and walk out. You, you don't want to listen to me anyway. So. In Exodus chapter 18, last week we talked about Exodus chapter 4 and 5 where Moses uh, was in front of the burning bush experience. And now this is 40 years later. The people are coming out of bondage. L Moses is the leader and uh, he, he kind of has a family reunion with his father-in-law, Jethro. He was working for Jethro and tending his sheep. And, and now Moses has gone to Egypt. And Moses has taken his people out of Egypt. And now they're at the promised land. They're, they're wandering in the wilderness. And, and Moses being in charge, he was talking to his people. And he was communicating to everyone. He had thousands and thousands of people that he was the leader of. And he needed somebody to help him. He needed an influence. Now, have you ever been the man in charge and the man in charge needed somebody to help them out? Moses was the man, but the man was having troubles. So the bigger influence was his father-in-law. 
And Moses was so busy doing so many different things that he couldn't do anything right. And he was struggling. And in Exodus chapter 18, he comes in and his father-in-law Jethro comes up and he starts talking to him about some things. So I want to read starting in verse 13 of Exodus chapter 18. Um, and it, it's a few, but it's a really good thing about, about how, to, how to listen to influence. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people. And they stood around from morning till evening. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, what is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you alone set and judge? Why are all these people around you from morning till evening? Okay, let's stop right there. In other words, it's kind of like the DMV. Okay, anybody been in the DMV? You sit there and you're watching the number and it never goes and you're sitting there and you're sitting, you have a meeting in an hour and a half and, it, and it's, it's 30 minutes to your meeting. There's only two people gone by. And you get so frustrated because they can't serve you. All the people, whenever there was a dispute, whenever there was a problem, they waited in line to talk to Moses. The entire line, from morning till night, Moses sat in his judge's chair, and people waited and waited and waited and came up and talked to Moses. Jethro goes, what is this you are doing? Not only you are going to be tired, they are going to be tired waiting, and then they are going to have dispute with you. You need to do something different. And he, what he's saying is, this is not all about you. If you are going to be a person of influence, a person of leadership, you can't do everything yourself. You must put people in place. And I'm trying to say, if we want to be a person of influence, it is not always going to be yours. You might have to have somebody to come around you and to help you. Moses answered him, because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decree and instructions. Moses' father-in-law replied, what you are doing is not good. And these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice, and may God be with you. Isn't it neat when somebody says, listen, I love you. What you're doing is self-destructive. What you're doing is not helpful. I love you, and I want to give you some advice. Now, what you do with somebody's advice is totally up to you. You can listen to them. You can say, yeah, 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 yeah. Do you know who I am? Do you know what I have done? I have talked to God. Have you talked to God? I led the thousands of people out of captivity. Have you led thousands of people out of captivity? I am the man. God used me. Why are you trying to tell me what to do? And sometimes when somebody gets arrogant, they do not listen to godly advice. And whenever we get to the point that we will not listen to somebody's advice, we are saying, I am more important. I can do what I want to do. But God always, always brings people into our life with a humbled attitude to say, can I help you? Can I serve you? And we have to give them the opportunity to speak influence into our life. Moses, he didn't have to do this. But Moses did something that changed his life. He changed his leadership culture. It started with change. It started with change. Let's look 17, 18, and 19. So Moses' father-in-law said to him, the thing that you are doing is not good. Both you and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out. For this thing is too much for you, and you're not able to perform it by yourself. Listen now to my voice, and I will give you counsel, and God will be with you. Stand before God for the people, so that you may bring the difficulties to God. So Moses heeded the voice of his father-in-law and did what he had said. So there's a couple things. The first thing, when, when he confronted Je Jethro confronted Moses, he did two things. The first thing, he changed his way of thinking. Somebody else could have a good idea. I, I, I might not do the right thing all the time. So sometimes we have to change the way that we think. 
And if we change the way that we think, it can change the outcome that we have. Moses changed the way he was thinking, and Moses changed his way of working. What you are doing is not good. You are going to wear yourself out and these people out. So sometimes when you have an influence within your life and somebody comes up to you and says, you know what, I love you, but you need to make some changes. It may be at work. It may be in your home. It may be in your finances. It may be in any area. But if you allow somebody that you respect to come in and to influence you by speaking words to you, it can really change the way that you think and it changes the way that you work. Moses made seven major changes to become the man of influence. The first thing, he became a man of prayer. He became a man of prayer. Before he did, he went to pray. Verse 19, listen now to my voice. I will give you counsel and God will be with you. Stand before God for the people so that they may bring the difficulties to God. Stand with God. In other words, if you have a problem, it's not about you. You know, the first part of this chapter 18, you know, Jethro is, they're coming up, they haven't talked in a while because Moses has been busy doing all the captivity stuff. And, and uh, they came up and they had a, a family reunion. And Jethro and Moses started talking. Now, in, in our culture, if, if, if I got to do the stuff that Moses did, I would say, let me tell you what I did. I, I, I stood before Pharaoh. I, 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 can't, I had ten uh, uh, plagues that I called down, and, and, and then the water turned to blood because I put my rod in it. And, and I, I was doing all this awesome stuff. I am pretty stinking powerful. But when he went to Jethro, he said, let me tell you what the Lord did. Let me tell you what God provided. Everything that Moses told Jethro, it wasn't about him. It was about him. The heart of a humble man is not look at what I can do. It's look what God can do through me. And when we become humble that God can do things through us, God then can use us. So the first thing that we have to do before we can be used by God is we have to talk to God. The first step. We never get so arrogant. Never get so thinking that you are in charge. First thing we must do is stand before God and talk to God about every issue. And Jethro told him, don't do it yourself. Stand before God. And then he committed himself to communication. He committed himself to communication. And you shall teach them the statutes and the laws that you show them in the way in which they must work. Communicate. Don't demand. I like what it says here. And they teach them the statutes. Don't just assume everybody knows what to do. Don't just assume everybody's going to do what you want them to do. Teach them. That's what the church is supposed to do. The church is supposed to equip and teach them to do the work of the ministry. Moses said, teach them. We must teach them the commandments. Let them know what you're going to do, but don't just assume that they're going to know it. Teach. You have to communicate. And then he laid out the vision. Verse 20, it says, and you shall teach them the statutes and the law and show them the way in which they must walk. Show them the way that they must walk. The biggest influencer in Moses' life is his father-in-law, Jethro. And he said, and pray. And he said, teach. But the biggest thing is model. Show them the way that they must walk. You know, when we don't walk correctly, when we don't communicate correctly, when we don't do things correctly in front of other people, we lose the ability to have influence. We lose the ability to speak into somebody else's life. But when somebody respects you, when somebody knows your actions and your walk is correctly, we can cast that vision. We can give hope to them. And then four, he developed a plan. He developed a plan. At the end of verse 20, it says, and you shall walk in the way that they must walk and work they must do. They must do some work. They, you're sitting here all day long and people are coming to you, and it's a one-man show. You, you can't do that. You may be able to handle that for a year or six months, but you have to get with you some people that you trust, and you have to bring them around you, and you can get some help. But if you want to say, look at what I did, look how great I am, look how great of a leader I am, that's fine. 
But you know what? That's not going to last very long. To be a person of influence, you have to bring people around you. The fifth thing, he settled and trained others to influence. He selected and trained others for influence. Verse 21, moreover, you shall select from the people able men such to fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of five hundreds and rulers of fifties and rulers of ten. Place in front of people. In other words, give your authority away. Jethro is saying, listen, I love you enough. I don't want you to burn out, and I don't want them to hate you. Put around you people that can take care of thousands and take care of hundreds and take care of tens and even take care of fives. Find people around you that they can settle some disputes and they can talk and they can share. It's not the king, Lord syndrome. It is the family syndrome. It's let's do it together. And if we are ever in a place of leadership and it's all about me and everything has to go around me and nobody else can make a decision, we are going to fail miserably. So he had to select and give to people influence so they could have more influence within the family. And then he released them to do the work. He released them to do the work in verse 22. And let them judge the people at all times. Then it will be that very great matter they shall bring it to you. But every small matter these themselves shall judge. So it will be easier for you, for they will bear the burden for you. They will bear the burden. Let each of them talk. The man of influence is saying, share the wealth. Let others help you. Sometimes we have the control center. Anybody control freaks? Raise your hand. Okay, some people are awesome. Some people say, yeah, I'm a control freak. Some people have to be in control. Have to be in control. Now, this sermon is not for you necessarily, Karen, but you may gain something from it. <laughs> control. Self-aware, that is true, that is true, that is true. And James already told us that you were, so. <laughs> when we are in control, when everything is going great, everything is fine. But when we are control freaks and things are not in control, what do we do? We stress out, we freak out, and we try to fix. And sometimes we fix things, it becomes chaotic. What we must do when we're control freaks is say, you know what? How can I control this? I can give it to God, and I can train, help, and serve other people. If you're a manager of business, or, or if you're a leader of a corporation, or if you're a lead at work, you know that you have to have people that can help you. And you see people right off the bat who are going to be leaders and who are going to be followers. You know, almost less than 10% of the United States would actually call themselves leaders. Most people don't want the responsibility of lead. So what we have to do is if they don't want to lead, what we must do is influence them to be who God wants them to be, to do the work. And then he did not only want, he did not only what they could, he did only what he could not do. Um, when somebody can't do something, we have to step up and do it. And that's when the control freaks, that's when the leaders, if somebody can't do it, let's make it happen. Let's get it done. Then it will be changed at every great matter they shall bring to you. You know, when you're talking about Jethro's influence over Moses, it changed everything about him. How did he transfer being the one man, the leader of Israel, the leader of a new country, the leader of thousands of individuals? And he came up and he was the judge. And Jethro said, it'll never work. What had to change? Okay, here's that, this transition. Do the things others are unwilling to do. And that's called servanthood. Do the things others are unwilling to do. When we want to influence others, we have to do what others are unwilling to do. We have to do the simple things. And if we serve God in the simple things, in the things that nobody really wants to do, uh, we, we joke about the nursery a lot. But every week they say, man, man, Bruce, is this going to be a short sermon or a long sermon? I'm back there with 30 little kids. <laughs> you know what? That's servanthood. When, 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 you, when you take off a week and go to youth camp to cook, taking five days of your vacation, that's servanthood. When you do things that maybe nobody else really wants to do, that's servanthood. 
And the way that you have influence with others is by sacrifice and being a servant. You know, it was awesome watching these kids. Every counselor there, every counselor there, they would sit around, they would talk, and they would be with the kids. They would joke with them. They would play with them. You know what? What those counselors did for those kids was gained influence. Now, they may not have changed everything about their life. But you know what? When they walked in, you know, not too many people would call me this, but they called me Brucey. They called me Brucey. I got together. They said, they said, called me Brucey. I said, nobody calls me Brucey. Nobody calls me Brucey. So I'm hoping I don't get in trouble for this one. But we had, we had a kid that, that was has, having some troubles. And uh, I, I spent, they said, they said, Bruce, will you sit with me at camp? I said, sure. I said, Bruce, can you play this game with me? Yeah, for three or four hours, this boy that never talks to me at all, all he wanted to do is sit and talk, sit and play, asked me to go sit with him at camp. I sat with him right at camp. We, we got to talk. We prayed together. We just got to spend some time at camp together. And now we played a game. And that first game after we got done, he skipped me twice. <laughs> anyway, he, 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 tried to, he was trying to hurt me. You know what? He goes, he, he goes, he goes, I like you. <laughs> cool. That's a way to show that you like me. You skip me so I can't even play the game. But a boy, and a boy that really didn't have anything to do with me for three or four hours, I got to sit and have influence within his life. That is not my, on my part servanthood. Most people say, oh, just let him go play in the corner. No, that's what everybody else is doing. Why don't we get him out of the corner and get into somebody's life? And I believe that's what we need to do. When somebody doesn't want to do something, let's serve them anyway. Do things that others should do by modeling. Just because it needs to be done. Somebody needs something. Let's model what we can do. Let's do what God wants us to do. Uh, do things that others can learn to do. We, we need to do things that others can learn to do. They may not know how to do it right now, but if I model them and I share with them, then I can say, will you please take this over? And I can take my hands off of it and let somebody else do something great, and that's called equipping them. We have to equip others to do the work of the ministry and do things that others cannot do. That's influencing them. Doing things that others can do. We have to influence now, we're talking about the way that Jethro communicated to Moses. And Moses changed the way that he led a nation. When we're talking about servanthood, modeling, equipping, and influencing, it's the same thing as what we have to do in our church. We have to serve people. If the church does not serve, we fail. If a family does not serve, we fail. Modeling. If we do not model what faith is all about to the world, the world is not going to understand what the church is all about. They're going to think the church is about coming to church at 1030 on Sunday morning. The church is not about coming here at 1030 on Sunday morning. The church is much greater than that. But we must model what we should be. We have to get out and do what we need to do. And then equipping. We have to equip. We have to teach we have to love, I love listening to teaching. I, we have Right Now Media. If you haven't signed up for Right Now Media, uh, I, I want to encourage you to sign up for Right Now Media. If you don't know what that is, if you're new to the church, it is thousands of video teachings, sermons that is completely free to you. The church buys all these things, and you sign up through your email. You can download. It has kids' videos. It has teaching videos. It has sermon videos, small group sessions, marriage counseling, financial. I mean, everything that you would ever possibly want. I about tripped. Everything that you'd possibly ever want on Right Now Media. So if you haven't signed up for Right Now Media, please call the office. We'd love to have you sign up because it is a teaching, equipping time. You can sign up. You can watch that, and you can learn learn, learn. I, I make a commitment to myself. Every morning, I, I lock my office door, and I sit there, and I turn on Right Now Media, and I do a 45-minute small group Bible study every morning, no matter what, just for me, not part of my sermon preparation, just so I can learn, so I can grow. And I think that if everybody says, you know what, I may not have 45 minutes. If you have 15 minutes, if you have 20 minutes, you can take right now media and you can learn and you grow if we do not model our 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 growth our love if we don't grow 
And if we don't grow spiritually, what we're going to do is we're going to stagnate. So we have to equip ourselves. And do what others cannot do is influence. So what's the results of Moses' change? He said in verse 23, If you do these things, and God so commands you, then you'll be able to endure, and all the people will also go to their place in peace. As a leader, as a church, if we equip, if we model, if we serve one another, what's going to happen is you are going to be strengthened, and the people will be able to have peace. They stood in line all day and all night to get something from Moses. And Jethro said, what what you're doing is not good. And there's things within your life and there's things within my life that if I would allow somebody to be an influence within my life, they would say, Bruce, what you're doing, it's not good. It may work and it may be what you're doing and it may be successful, but it's not good. You can't have a long-term goal It's not going to be successful. People aren't going to follow. People aren't going to be happy. They're going to be miserable. So find that person of influence. That you're saying, I need to have somebody speak value into my life. I'm struggling in this area in my life. I'm struggling in my marriage. I'm struggling in certain areas. I need an influencer. Just as Moses was on top of the world. He had everything at his disposal. God used him like nobody else. But he needed somebody to influence him. And Moses was humble enough to accept that influence. He didn't say, nah, I don't need you. He looked at him and said, thank you. Making changes in our life when ultimately we know that we need it. Moses didn't want to sit on a judge's chair 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Listen to disputes. How boring would that get? People not liking you. People hating this decision. They don't like this decision. Jethro says, listen, get some help. Get some help. Just what we need in our church and in your life. Get some help. If you want your joy and if you want your peace, you need to have somebody within your life that you can say, I need to talk to somebody. I need an influencer. And don't be afraid. Somebody may say something that you don't like. Be self-aware. Being self-aware says, I know. What I'm doing works, but it's not making me happy. So you need to have an influencer within your life. But here's the greatest key. And I tell this with counseling all the time. You know, when, when you're sitting in my office and, and you're sitting on the other chair and I'm sitting there and I, you're telling me your problems and I'm talking to you about it. And I'm saying, you know, you're the greatest, you're a better counselor than I am. I said, because anybody that sits in the other chair and I'm telling you my stories and I'm telling you my fears, you would, be ha- you would have no problem to dissect and to figure out what I should do. You probably could do it without any problem because you're not attached to it. You, have, you can see, you can articulate it, you can communicate about it. Because when we influence others, we say, God, what do you want me to do? Come into somebody's life and allow somebody to be an influence within your life. And we must be an influence in somebody else's life. It goes both ways. We must say, I need help here. But as I'm getting help here, I want to help somebody else down here. And when I can influence somebody else and I can encourage someone else, it makes my day wonderful. You know, coming back from that camp with that little boy, um, seeing his smile on his face, calling me Brucey. You know, and somebody said, well, yeah, that's your pastor. You shouldn't call him Brucey. I said, you know what? He likes me. <laughs> God knows who I am. I'm not getting my identity because a boy calls me Brucey. I'm happy that he wants to be around me. I'm happy that I get to speak volume in life. That's what's important. That's what camp is all about. So now some little girls are calling me, Brucey. I, like, uh, <laughs> I should say, no, it's Pastor Thomas, and call me that. <laughs> when you get to speak wisdom, influence, and passion into somebody's life, and they accept it, and some of their life is changed, 
what happens is God is using you. God is using you. Have you ever had God use you? Have you ever, have you ever supernaturally just said, thanks. I, I, I started the day not necessarily knowing that I was going to help somebody out. But in the midst of chaos or in the midst of a problem, God supernaturally showed up and said, Bruce, I want you to do that. Danny, I want you to do this right here. And you say, I really don't want to. I really don't want to play that card game. I really don't want to go. To... That's what I want you to do. And then we do it and all of a sudden, because we're willing to do what God wants us to do, we become an influence over somebody and that influence can change someone's life. God wants to use us to be an influence. Jethro, for 40 years, worked on the land, was a priest in Median. Je Jethro stayed in the same place. Moses left, brought hundreds of thousands of people through the wilderness. Moses was the man. Jethro was a nobody. But Jethro, being a nobody, got to speak influence into the somebody because Jethro listened to God. And because of Moses, a nation was born. Because of Moses, the church is here. Because of Moses, the, the work of the church is alive. I like the idea that somebody of influence will listen to somebody with very little influence. But the man with little influence changed Moses. Changed the way he prayed. Changed the way that he worked. Changed the way that he saw God. That's the, what I believe the church is supposed to do. Is to be a church of influence. You know, watching 6,000 kids at camp. Six, can you imagine 6,000 stinky kids? And I think, I, I, I'm sorry if you have boys that went to camp, but I don't think the showers worked on the boy side, <laughs> if you know what I mean. I walked up there and I said, oh my Lord, whoo, that is nasty. I, I think the girls were just bad, but I didn't go up on the guy, girl side. <laughs> when you can influence, when you can walk into somebody's life, the church is supposed to be a church of influence. When we lose our influence, we lose our power. Losing our power in the body of Christ. We have to realize this church is here to influence a world that's dying and going to hell for the cause of Jesus Christ. That's our job. If somebody comes in and says, I want to speak influence within your life. If we are not doing what God wants us to do, we need to change who we are listening to. The influence within our life is, it's not about us. Moses was sitting all day long being the judge, they were happy. They were doing the kumbaya. They were doing what they thought was right. And Jethro says, change it. What you're doing isn't right. And Moses said, okay, let's change. So when somebody comes into our life and what we're doing is what we're used to, but what we're doing is not working, we need to listen to that influence and make changes. I don't know who's going to influence you. I know that God wants to influence you. I don't know who you're going to influence, but I know God wants you to get into somebody's life. But what we can do is seek God's face and say, Lord, bring to me somebody like a Jethro that can speak into my life, that can help me. Whether it is our relationships or whether it is our job or whether it is our students, it may be our spiritual life. Lord, let me have an influencer and then let me have somebody that I can influence, that I can serve, that I can love, that I can help. Then I believe I will be at peace. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you. and Lord, we all need to be able to see what you want for us to do. We need people of influence within our life. I pray that you will allow us to have that influence. And Lord, I pray that we can be that influence for somebody. That people's lives will be changed, encouraged, helped, and ministered to. So Lord, thank you for your love to us. Thank you for Jethro. Thank you for allowing him to speak into Moses' life and then telling us the story. And I pray so much that we can and we will influence others for the cause.
of Jesus Christ. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Um, time of invitation is prayer. The first thing that Moses did when he changed his life, he prayed. Um, so we're going to have a song played. We're not going to open the altars as far as for people to come down. But I would like for you just to spend 30 seconds to a minute in prayer. And I want you to ask God for two things. How can I get influence from somebody else? Who is it that's above me? Who is it that's around me that I am willing to say I need some help? And then who is it below you that I can give help? Somebody that you can get it from and somebody that you can give it to. Because if you can do both of those things, you become a better person. You help somebody and you get help from somebody gives us peace within our hearts. So let us spend some time praying, thinking on those two points. Who can I help and who can I get help from? And then we'll finish out. So let's pray.